Today, I'm gonna to teach you everything you need to know about calibrating your resin 3D printer. When you're calibrating your resin 3D printer, there's really only one objective. And that objective is to get the resin as hard as you can before it gets too big. Now, I know what you're thinking. Derek, how do I do that? Well, lucky for you, I'm here to show you exactly how. Before I get started, I wanna clarify, there are two zones that need to be calibrated. The first one is the burn-in layers. These are the first five to 10 layers that are gonna print. And then there's the normal layers. This is the remainder of the print. This video is only gonna be covering the normal layer calibration, not the burn-in layer calibration. That will be kind of in a combination of a different video, as well as I've already done a video on if your build plate is out of level, and there's some information in there about that. Now, there are a lot of calibration parts out there. What you might not know is that most of them specialized in one thing or the other. Most calibration parts out there specialize in what's called visual accuracy. On this one, what you're trying to do is get it to look like it should, closely getting as close to dimensionally accurate as you can visually see. These calibration parts are usually these flat ones, like the XP2 validation. They're Pro is that they print very fast and they use a rather small amount of resin because there's really not much here. Their cons are that you can't ever get perfectly accurate just by visually looking at it. Depending upon your eyes and the camera you have, you can get better. The next thing about it is they don't take strength into account. Remember when I said at the very beginning, what we're trying to do is get the resin as hard as we can while maintaining accuracy. This right here will get accuracy, but has nothing to indicate the resin hardness. And that's one of the big drawbacks of these flat calibration parts. In fact, all of these share the exact same thing, whether it be the one that I designed for running a multi-cure calibration or even the frozen ones. Now the frozen one and the um, XP2 are my favorite of these flat ones. They're very easy to read, easy to clean, and easy to work with. I do like them, but I said they all suffer from that exact same thing. If we want to start testing resin hardness, we need some sort of test that can test the strength. Now there's also calibration parts that purely test for strength and kind of disregard accuracy. And some that, you know, of course we've already shown do accuracy and disregard strength. And again, what we want is we want to test for strength while maintaining accuracy. That's the most important thing. That's what we want to do. So one that I like a lot, and it's also one of the older ones I was first shown case to was the town. Now, the thing I like about town is that it has visual components of both accuracy and not. I think the, the part of this test that most people pay attention to are the checkers on the bottom and the uh, pillars on the front. So the idea is if you increase the exposure more, you'll get more pillars, but the checkers start to flatten out. If you decrease the exposure, the checkers start to print more properly, but you lose pillars. So this is a little bit more of like a give and take. So you get to pick, you, the user, get to pick whether you want more hardness or more accuracy. It's, it's one or the other. And that's, you know, that's kind of unique and nice. In fact, it's one of the few that lets you, the user, decide which one and visually see which one you're getting or losing. The drawback of this print is it's rather tall and can take a long time to print. These pins right here are also um, very sensitive. They're very easy to break. You better be very careful when you're cleaning this or you might break the pillars and think that you did worse than you actually did. And then that brings down to the one that I developed myself. This is boxes of calibration. This is a blown up version. This is ridiculous. This will tell you nothing. It's just stupid, but it's fun, so whatever. What this does is this lets you test for accuracy using the boxes. You can either use a pair of digital calipers where you just measure the boxes. In the normal size is this tiny thing over here. And in the normal size, the big box should measure eight millimeters. And then the wall should measure 0.89. All the walls measure the same, um, sorry, 0 0.98. 0 0.98 millimeters for the walls. Uh, and they, the boxes measure eight, six, or four millimeters. If you don't have a pair of digital calipers, you snap the box off and you set it inside of it. Now, the reason why the box is square is so that you have the option of either or on every single test. And so being able to measure the wall thickness or the boxes on X, Y, gives you a lot of points to make sure you're accurate. Now, the way this works is we remember what we care about is the hardness of the resin while maintaining accuracy. That's calibration. So the way this works is once the boxes are all within spec of measurement, and I'll say give or take 0.4 millimeters is about what you're after. You then look at these pillars. Now these pillars are the exact same thing you'd find on town. The point of these pillars is the more pillars you have, the more strength your resin has, the harder your resin is. So the objective is get as many pillars as you can, but only while maintaining the dimensional size of the boxes. The boxes in this way are a control. And they make sure that if someone is, if someone shows me a picture of this calibration and they have all the pillars, but none of the boxes fit, well, if I were to measure the pillars, they wouldn't measure the correct uh, size. So it's not really, uh, it's a strength test, but not a tensile strength test. At the beginning of this video, I promised I was gonna tell you how to get the most hard resin while maintaining accuracy. And this is where I'm gonna do that. So the first thing we wanna make sure 
to get the best accuracy that we can get is that we're not just doing what these flat calibration prints are telling us to do. We're not just simply decreasing the UV exposure time. Because you may not know this, but when you expose resin to UV radiation, two things happen. The first thing is the resin gets hard. It turns from a liquid to a solid. And this, the longer it's exposed, the hotter it's going to get. And hotter resin expands faster than cold resin. Also, the more energy it's exposed to, the longer the UV light is on, the more that resin is going to grow and grow and grow and grow. In fact, it can grow quite large if you expose it long enough. You can probably not fully cure an entire vat deep, but you leave it on long enough, you might be able to. The second thing happens is, of course, it gets hard. So it physically grows and then it gets harder. And so what we're trying to do is balance the two hardness versus that uh, out of control growth that happens when we add in, you know, longer exposure time and heat. Well, there's ways to do this. And the, probably the best way to do this is what's called light off delay or wait before print. What this does is when the printer goes down and the motor stops spinning, your resin and the printer is still moving. The printer has to come back to square. I have not seen a single printer to date uh, in this price range or even more expensive that doesn't have some flex and movement. So when that build plate's coming down, that printer's flexing and bowing and moving. So when the motor stops spinning, the printer's still coming back to square. Well, that means that that resin's still flowing. And even when that printer stops moving, completely stops moving, which takes a lot longer than you think, that resin's still flowing. Now, if you're going to cure resin that's flowing, you're going to never reach very good accuracy. On accuracy, I'm not talking about just getting measurable accuracy. I'm talking about the quality of your prints. I'm talking about keys fitting on uh, parts that have multiple parts that go together. So you don't have to sand them down or you know wonder why this doesn't fit here you know, nice and flush. A lot of that has to do with curing flowing resin or not doing what you can to achieve accuracy through light off delay. So light off delay is your best friend. And in fact, that is the most powerful tool you have for accuracy outside of adjusting the UV exposure time. The second thing, which I kind of already mentioned, is temperature. If you're trying to cure cold resin, I would say below 20 degrees Celsius, you might have a really hard time. You might have to expose it for a very long time. In doing so, there's gonna be a lot of light scattering and it's not gonna be accurate at all. Uh, you'll eventually cure it, but it's gonna be pretty uh, a pretty bad print. On the opposite end of that, too hot, I would say above 30 degrees for most resins and some resins you wanna keep it about around 28. The opposite happens. You can get so fast curing that you start getting what we call over curing or Z bloom. And this is what happens if you ever wonder why maybe some of your parts are really, really thick, thicker than they should be. This is what happens when you overexpose a print for too long on the layers and it actually physically grows out on the Z axis. Heat makes this really, really difficult. In fact, if you're calibrating resin that's clear, you generally wanna keep your layer height over 50 UM. You probably wanna try uh, 100 UM. That's gonna make it a lot easier to calibrate clear resins as they really like to bloom. Same thing with white resins or yellow resins. They're all kind of notorious for this one. So for those ones, you probably don't want to use anything lower than 50, but I would recommend going up to one UM or 100 UM. The next thing is of course, speed and lift. If you're lifting too high or too fast, this can cause a lot of turbulence on your resin. Same thing with retract speed. If you're retracting too fast, or um, you know what goes up must come back down. So if I lift really, really high, I have to come back down really, really high. Now, if I've got a bunch of resin in my vat and I've got some really delicate parts, they have to plunge out of that resin and in that resin. And you can imagine there's a lot of forces in there to displace all that resin over and over and over again. So if you keep doing that, there's a chance that smaller bits can shift, move or fail altogether. And of course, speed increases uh, force. So if you're plunging into the resin really, really fast, there's gonna be a much higher PSI. And if you're pulling really, really fast, there's gonna be much higher peeling forces that can cause smaller components to break and a loss in accuracy. Now understand this can get a little confusing, so I made this chart hopefully to help us understand what's going on. Each one of these affects these in a different way. Exposure time affects all three of them at the same time and affects them by the most. Light delay affects them least and speed and distance affects them less than light off delay. Let's say I'm using these XB validation or the frozen test. And what I'm going after is I, it looks really great. And my exposure time is probably a little bit on the low side because I'm focusing on resin blooming or is it the proper size? What's probably happening is my success rate is going to be low and I'm going to be slightly under cured. And most people are going to have a sprint speed that's maybe a little bit on the faster end. Now the issue with this one is our success rate is low because we're only focused on the resin blooming. We haven't focused on resin hardness. And so something like this, what it might look like is where the boxes would fit, but there would be no pillars. So if I wanna fix this, what I need to do is use light off delay. Going from off delay from zero seconds to let's say somewhere around three to four seconds is actually gonna make the largest impact. It's gonna move down quite a bit. 
moving it further up is only going to make it move a small amount. So generally you're going to be best somewhere between two seconds and five seconds for the optimum results. So you can see now this all dropped. So now everything is low. So what we get to do now is we get to increase the exposure time. Increasing the exposure time is going to increase the resin hardness. It's going to increase the size. And because of that happens, our resin success rate is going to go up quite a bit. Using exposure time and light off delay is how we're going to affect the hardness, the resin blooming, and our success rate. Lift distance and speed, this one's a little bit interesting. If we print really, really fast, what's, our prints are going to be fast, but the resin's also going to get really, really hot. When resin cures, it releases heat. And the slower the print is, the more time the heat has to dissipate into the environment. So what's going to happen is this is actually going to become overcured and overexposed. And our success rate, because we're printing so fast, is actually going to drop some. In order to help this out, what I see a lot of people do is they increase the UV exposure time even more, making this worse and this worse, and this goes up a little bit. And they like to print somewhere in this area. Of course, people who are going fast generally also aren't using light off delay. And this makes this get even a little bit worse. So what I see is very similar to something like this with people who are printing very, very fast. On the opposite end, if you're printing very, very slow and you're using lots of light off delay, what's going to happen is your resin's gonna be kind of cold unless you have a heater. In fact, it could be so cold that it can be really hard to print. So you could actually all end up all the way down here. And you have to increase the UV exposure time to get these to mudge even a little bit. And what ends up happening is you have something that's kind of a bigger issue, but it has to do with temperatures. Now, if you put in a vat heater, this can be fixed because now you're controlling the temperature and these can be very, very accurate and your success rate can be very, very high. The problem is your prints are gonna take a really long time. And so it's generally not recommended to do that just because of the print time, even if the outcome is really great. The next thing to maintain accuracy is of course the physical printer itself. If we get to the physical world, these things matter. If your LCD is dirty, your screen protector is dirty or your release film is dirty or scratched, well, you're not gonna get very good accuracy out of that printer. So maintenance of your printer is very important to maintain really good accuracy throughout the life of your machine. The second thing is of course, the technology of your printer. Some printers have better lighting engines. The higher quality lighting engine, the more accurate it's gonna be. And of course the LCD. Pay no attention to 8K, 4K, 12K, you know, that doesn't really mean so much. But what we care about is the pixel size, the X, Y, U, M. Something that's 50 U, M, of course, is not going to be as accurate as something that's 14 or 19 U, M, which we find on some of the smaller, more accurate printers. This can be hard to tell. It's generally, it's, a lot of it times it's measurable and it can be easily observed on, a, on hard surfaces, but on organic surfaces with a lot of texture, the difference between, let's say, a 40 U, M printer and a 20 U, M printer on XY is actually pretty hard to see and you'd be surprised that you'd probably be, be happy with both. Well, I think that about covers it. So if there's anything that I said that sounds confusing, please come reach out to me on the Lightly Slicer Discord or comment below. Also make sure to like and subscribe our YouTube channel so we can keep creating videos like this for you as well as our other social media. And thank you for watching. Have a good day.